China's been all about diplomatic charm, pushing a military non-intervention policy as its way of playing nice for economic gains. But let's not kid ourselves. That strategy has a lot to do with the tight hold the US and NATO pals have on key regions like Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific. Despite emerging as the world's second largest economy, outpacing Western counterparts through sheer volume, China finds itself at a crossroads. Industrially, it's a powerhouse, fueled by an expansive workforce. Technologically, however, it trails behind the US, revealing a significant gap in innovation and military prowess. This gap has become glaringly apparent in the face of military conflicts such as the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. The conflict has not only tested the mettle of those directly involved, but also offered a window into the Western military arsenal. As Ukraine continues to receive a steady flow of support from NATO, including tanks, missiles, you name it, arming them to stand their ground or at least hold the line against Russia, the world witnesses the depth and breadth of Western military support. But just how deep does the rabbit hole of Western weaponry superiority go? Follow us as we dive into the cutting-edge arsenal that's shaping the balance of power on the global stage. Let's take the newest missile systems as an example. There are three main missiles that Ukraine has received to turn the tide of the war. Storm Shadows, Atakums, and Star Streaks. The Storm Shadow is among the latest generation missiles produced by the UK and France. It's one of the most consistent air-to-ground ordnances available and Ukraine has managed to use its potential to remove Russian infrastructure with great success. The secret behind the Storm Shadow's effectiveness lies in its increased range. While traditional missiles could reliably hit targets from 70 or 80 miles away, the maximum range of the Storm Shadow is around 150 miles. This means that Ukrainian forces could feasibly push Russia back away from its borders with precision strikes to infrastructure and supply convoys. The increased range allows the Storm Shadow to be fired out of detection giving Russia much less time to respond and minimize the damage. Storm Shadows also have the logistical and tactical advantage over many similar missiles currently in use. Due to a trifecta of state-of-the-art navigational systems, GPS, inertial positioning, and terrain contour matching, the Storm Shadow has unparalleled accuracy. Additionally, since the systems are designed to provide redundancy, the missile is much less susceptible to technological counterattacks. If an enemy tried to disable one of the navigational systems, the rest would be able to guide the missile to the target without any issues. The combination of range and security means that the Storm Shadow missiles can present a serious long-range artillery threat. This is further emphasized by the fact that Ukraine has had major success with the missile, despite its inability to utilize its potential to the fullest. While the Storm Shadow has excellent navigation systems, the pilot still needs to lock onto the target. With more advanced aircraft, the targeting system can work in sync with the missile. This allows it to use a fire-and-forget launching method, giving the pilot free reign to retreat from enemy airspace. If combined with a long-range aircraft, the Storm Shadow can strike down enemy targets with minimal danger to the pilot and the plane. However, Ukraine didn't have planes that could integrate these advanced targeting systems. The Soviet-era MiG-29 and Su-27s weren't designed with those capabilities, and the country hasn't done much to upgrade the planes with more modern systems. As a result, the army has been forced to use makeshift systems that could only partially leverage the Storm Shadow's power. This typically means that the weapon's range would be decreased to that of the targeting system, in Ukraine's case, it resulted in a range of roughly 100 miles, with anything above that heavily reducing accuracy. Considering that even with a technological mismatch between Ukrainian planes and the Storm Shadow, Ukraine has been able to get solid results, imagine how effective those missiles would be with proper support from modern aircraft. This should be possible in a few months, however, since the US, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium have agreed to send F-16s to Ukraine. With these fourth-generation aircraft, the Storm Shadows could be used to their full extent. Similar concepts apply to the other two missiles. The Atakums, for example, is a ground-deployed missile that requires a truck launcher. It has a higher speed than the Storm Shadow and can be outfitted with either a unitary or submunition warhead. When used with submunition warheads, Atakums can cover a huge area with explosives, making them especially effective at taking out enemy infantry and damaging infrastructure. However, the Atakums alone wouldn't be such a danger for the Russian troops. The real benefit came from the US sending HIMARS to Ukraine to outfit them. These mobile launchers can carry a vast assortment of missiles and can easily navigate the war-torn roads and harsh terrain across Ukraine, 
Additionally, HIMARS can be more easily camouflaged, allowing them to be deployed closer to the front line while minimizing the chance of detection. Finally, the vehicles could rapidly fire the missiles in stock and then drive away, giving enemies little time to determine their location and launch a counterattack. HIMARS have also been vital in cutting off Russian supplies from the warfronts. Due to the system's increased range compared to the closest Russian analog, the BM-30, HIMARS can be deployed to target and endanger vital bridges and roads that connect the Ukrainian outskirts with the border. Russians are then forced into a war of attrition where they can't engage the Ukrainian army due to a lack of equipment or supplies. Worse still, they also can't feasibly retreat without incurring heavy losses since the main channels are ripe for artillery attacks. As a prime example, Ukraine destroyed 50 ammunition depots within the first months of HIMARS being deployed throughout the country, decimating Russia's access to weapons. Even with all these perks, it should be noted that up until now, Ukraine has only received Atakum's M39 Block 1 missiles. These are submunition warhead missiles, but their range is drastically smaller than other Atakum's missiles at only 100 miles. Given that other types of missiles have an effective range in the realm of 170 to 190 miles, Western countries have an even more potent version of the Atakum's sitting in silos, waiting to be used against China if they happen to go to war. Finally, the Starstreak missiles are man-portable anti-air missiles capable of taking down enemy aircraft with extreme precision. They are unique in the sense that their warhead is split into three tungsten alloy darts with a delayed explosive charge. This creates a wider impact area should the darts hit a target, while also minimizing the risk of misfiring and failure to detonate. Due to a delayed explosion, the charges can be devastating against light-armored vehicles and aircraft. The tungsten dart first penetrates the armor casing, which triggers the delayed fuse. Once the dart is firmly embedded into the target, the charges detonate. A Starstreak missile is reportedly capable of splitting a helicopter in half. Additionally, the Starstreaks operate through a laser-guided targeting system. The operator must maintain line of sight on the target, limiting the missile's effective range to around 4.3 miles. However, the later iterations of the Starstreak guidance system heavily reduced the necessity to maintain tracking of the target at all times. The laser beams are effectively wider than the target, forming a two-dimensional matrix overlaying it. The reflections and imperfections in the matrix surface are picked up by the missile's targeting system, indicating the location of the target. Even if the targeting laser loses line of sight, the residual matrix location can be used as a fallback plan. While the Starstreak was developed in the late 90s, China hasn't unveiled a similar missile targeting and delivery system since. The closest analog is the FN6. However, FN6s have a shorter range and use an infrared targeting system. Although China claims that the system is resistant to flare interception, it's one of the biggest and most reliable counters to infrared designs. Furthermore, the FN6 is closer in design to the older US Stinger missiles, which were largely considered to have been made obsolete by the Starstreaks. Therefore, China's ground-based short-range anti-air defense is lagging behind the capabilities of Western countries. The efficiency of the Western military technology in Russia doesn't concern only artillery and missiles. NATO has supplied Ukraine with roughly $80 billion in humanitarian, military, and direct financial assistance, giving them access to resources the country couldn't have obtained in years otherwise. This is most notable in the efficiency and doggedness of Ukrainian troops. If we calculate the losses incurred by Russia over the last two years, the figures reaches a staggering 315,000 soldiers. Some sources suggest this figure is even higher. This is a combined number of deaths and injuries that have made soldiers unable to return to the battlefield, equaling 87% of the country's total army size at the start of the invasion. While Russia has instituted widespread conscription campaigns, and it has the benefit of having a much larger population to draw from, this is a monumental loss of people over two years. According to some estimates, it would make Russia's losses among the top five deadliest wars in the 21st century based on their duration. China has obviously seen the effect massive donations, financial aid, and military support can have on the world stage. While China's stance in the 2022 Russian invasion appears non-confrontational, their tacit or overt support for Russia speaks volumes. As the global community largely decries Russia's actions in Ukraine, China's silence and criticism of Western sanctions against Russia stands out. But what does China's economic lifeline to Russia amidst European sanctions reveal about the deeper strategic play at work? 
With Europe cutting off Russian energy exports to stifle military funding, China's move to tap into Siberia's resources not only rescues Russia from potential economic isolation, but also secures its own energy needs at bargain prices. How does this strategic maneuver affect the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, and what implications might it hold for global politics? China's main sore point in the 20th and 21st centuries is Taiwan, or Chinese Taipei. While China has been determined to exert more control over Taiwan, the island nation is currently being protected by the US military. Furthermore, China's claims in the South China Sea are directly contesting several nations in the region, creating a tense situation for China. The portion of the South China Sea that the country claims almost go to the vital Strait of Malacca, one of the busiest trading routes in the world and one of the main oil and gas transport routes between the Middle East and China. Considering that the Strait of Malacca is not under direct Chinese control, China has to depend on other countries in the area, allowing Chinese oil and gas-bearing ships to pass through the strait. These points of contention have resulted in a tenuous relationship between China and countries in the Indo-Pacific, all with China still trying to maintain its claims in the surrounding areas and exert more political and military pressure on Taiwan. This situation led to the creation of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or the Quad, between India, Japan, Australia, and the US. The Quad's main objective is to limit China's influence in the Indo-Pacific, creating a barrier between it and the other nations of the region. This is further complicated by the fact that China maintains claims on parts of the Himalayas that belong to India, creating additional strains between these two countries. As a result, India has even more of an incentive to oppose China's influence in the region. This has been further exacerbated by India recently opening more dialogues with the Western countries. In a deal with the US, India agreed on a plan that uses railroads and ports to transport goods between Europe and India. The plan involves building a series of railways to bypass the constricted Suez Canal, instead using Israeli Mediterranean ports in the west and the UAE's ports on the east of the Arabian Peninsula. The plan was made in response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to directly connect China to Europe via roadways, but also utilizing the Suez Canal and Strait of Malacca for international seaport access. China's BRI also plans to infuse Pakistan with $60 billion in investments to utilize the country's coal resources. China, therefore, has made extensive plans to become partially independent from its neighboring countries economically and prevent significant bottlenecks in its material imports. While China is the world's largest economy, its industry is heavily reliant on importing goods and raw materials. While the country has a significant population, it doesn't have nearly enough natural resources to maintain a growing industry. Any Western initiatives that ultimately control how much China can import goods and exert geopolitical and financial influence on other nations creates pressure on China's manufacturing industry. That's why China is hesitant to stir up trouble in its surroundings. If China makes the first move and it doesn't immediately gain positive results, it could end up in a similar situation as Russia is currently. However, what needs to be kept in mind are the main differences between the Russo-Ukrainian war and a potential China-Western conflict. Principally, that the West is only a proxy and a donator in the former. If China instigates a military conflict against the Western nations, they would be witness to the full military might of the West. During the war in Ukraine, NATO countries have been sending their last-generation equipment and weaponry. For example, the Storm Shadow has been in use by the UK and France since 1997, and both countries are currently developing an updated, more deadly version of the missile. According to a statement issued by the British Ministry of Defense, the replacement for the Storm Shadow, tentatively called the Future Cruise Anti-Ship Weapon, is expected to be in service by 2028. Another area where last-generation technology is prevailing in Ukraine is military aircraft. Ukraine's native airplanes include Soviet-era MiG-29 and Su-27s, which were basically left over from the Union after it broke up. Ukraine has done its best to maintain these planes, but their equipment hasn't been updated to modern standards. In contrast, Russia has upgraded its Soviet planes with modern radar and tracking capabilities, giving them an aerial advantage over Ukrainian planes. Additionally, Russia is also using the more advanced version of the plane with the designation Su-35. These are late fourth-generation planes, Russian counterparts to the F-15. Despite their upgrades, Russia has failed to maintain total air superiority over Ukraine, partially due to the vast amount of missiles that Ukraine can use to shoot down Russian aircraft. Some experts also believe that the Su-35 is vastly underperforming compared to its American counterparts, making them insufficient to gain an advantage in enemy territory. 
If that wasn't enough, the West, as mentioned previously, has also agreed to donate their F-16s to Ukraine. But what does that mean for the conflict ahead? These aircraft are planned to enter service sometime during 2024 due to heavy training requirements of Ukrainian pilots unfamiliar with these aircraft. By all accounts, the NATO countries that are sending these aircraft are basically decommissioning them from service in their respective aerial forces, mainly due to the F-16 being considered obsolete by modern standards. Instead, NATO members are currently purchasing and expecting a stockpile of modern F-35s and other aircraft to replenish their aging air force. The F-16s being shipped to Ukraine are expected to have a significant impact in the ongoing conflict. Some estimates show that the F-16s will help Ukraine exert air superiority over its entire airspace, with the F-16s providing key strategic and tactical support due to their improved radar range and service life. Other benefits of F-16 donations will give Ukraine the ability to fully utilize the advanced missiles they were given since Soviet era planes have largely incompatible missile targeting and launch systems for them. But where does that leave China? According to the latest reports from the Chinese military, the Mighty Dragon, or Chengdu J-20, is rumored to be the country's fifth-generation all-purpose military aircraft. While its specifications haven't been publicly released, leaks and extrapolations based on known equipment suggest that China is hoping it would have sufficient capabilities to go against F-22s and F-35s. However, the J-20 has been largely derived from previous-generation airplanes. In the main, this was due to China being able to steal information on military aircraft specs, or in one case, there were reports of Chinese agents crisscrossing the region where the F-117 disintegrated, buying up the parts from the plane from local farmers. But even if China could reverse-engineer the F-117's stealth technology, that's only a first-generation stealth aircraft, far behind the modern F-22s and F-35s. Add to that the fact that China seemingly hasn't been able to produce a jet engine on par with American engineering. By most accounts, the most recently updated version of the J-20 uses native WS-15 engines, which behave slightly worse than the engines inside F-22s. While China can feasibly manufacture many more engines, and some plans suggest that it aims to have 1,000 airplanes in service by 2030, the country is heavily reliant on efficient supply chains to do so. If China gets cut off from its resources, such as Russia deciding to sever its trading agreements with Beijing, for example, then its ambitions of building an air force that might be able to compete with the US could fail entirely. This circles back to the current Russo-Ukrainian conflict. With China relying on Russia to be a major trading partner and using Russia's plentiful natural resources in Siberia, it's no surprise that Xi doesn't want to stir up the pot and change the situation. After all, the current Russian regime is falling right into China's hands. Additionally, a prolonged war in Ukraine is more or less forcing NATO to intervene, if only by investing more financial resources and equipment into outfitting Ukraine. The current Israeli-Palestinian conflict has also played out well for China, delaying the progress of the Europe-Middle East-India trading corridor, and even shutting down the entire project due to the complex and unstable geopolitical situation. This means that China has free reign to plan for its ambitions of the Belt and Road Initiative due to a lack of viable trading alternatives. Furthermore, Saudi Arabia has staunchly remained neutral on this front, trying to use whichever initiative will benefit them the most. But if Russia fails to maintain supremacy in the Russo-Ukrainian war, then the country may experience a significant shift in ideology. In the unlikely case of Putin being removed from office, there's a chance that his successor might not view a close relationship with China so favorably. After all, China is currently laying claim to the Russian province of Outer Manchuria, which has been a significant thorn for China during the past century. It represents one of the only remaining pieces of territory that China hasn't been able to get back after the unequal treaties in the 19th and 20th century. All of which means that China might be actively trying to create a foothold in the area under the guise of extending its trading partnership with Russia. The geopolitical situation would also suggest that China might be gunning for the entire Siberian Far East and for multiple reasons. Apart from being rich in natural resources, Lake Balkai is located in Siberia, the largest freshwater deposit in the world, which would be an excellent target for exploitation to fuel the water-starved population centers in China. Additionally, controlling Siberia would provide China with access to the Sea of Japan on the east and even the Arctic Ocean up north. While the latter might seem insignificant, Arctic routes will allow China to bypass the maritime routes that depend on the Suez Canal and vital straits in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, this would make Beijing less dependent on favorable diplomatic ties with the countries that control them.
Making a move against Russia relies on China not facing any opposition from its south, which is where the US Navy is stationed. Additionally, the US has been outfitting its Marine Corps to be more independent all-terrain tactical support units. If the US can maintain control of military bases in the East China Sea, the Marines can support the US Navy and Air Force by exerting extreme area control. This would prevent the Chinese Navy from mounting a significant offensive or defensive front in the area. In a hypothetical Sino-Russian conflict, the US and the rest of the Quad could retaliate against China, cut off the Strait of Malacca and the resource transport it brings, and possibly force China to give up its claims over Taiwan. Therefore, China's only viable move is to remain a relatively silent observer in the matter. The future of the Russo-Ukrainian war hinges on whether Western weaponry can close out the war in Ukraine's favor quickly or risk the country being overwhelmed in an attrition war. If Russia loses, China might rapidly start losing the trading benefits it's received so far, but it might not have enough military power to influence that after the fact. But what do you think of China's non-interference policy in the war? Will China mount an offensive on Russia or Taiwan anytime soon? Let us know in the comments section below and thank you for watching the video. Now go and check out why the war in Ukraine shows the US military would destroy the Russian military, or click this other video instead.